Today, there are two million descendants of French Canadian immigrants living in New England. These are our stories. Welcome to the French Canadian Legacy Podcast. Venez tous jeunes fils et garçons, je vais vous raconter l'histoire de notre immigration ici au USA, de grands aventuriers de pays étrangers. This is the French Canadian Legacy Podcast. And I'm Bryce, also known as Bryce Hamble. And Dad is going to introduce himself. And I'm Mike Campbell. This is part three of our COVID-19 check-in episode. Again, we just wanted to thank everyone who gave us a few minutes of their time this weekend. We had so many people graciously accept our invitation that we had to split it up into three parts. And of course, we ran out of people to introduce the podcast. So our assistant editor, Bryce, is joining us for the introduction to part three. So Bryce, can you tell me a little bit about what's going on? Are you doing remote learning? Yeah. And so you and Dad do school lessons every day, don't we? Oh, yeah. Do you like doing lessons with Dad? Um, yes. Do you miss going to school each day? Yes. So, Bryce, has your life changed in any way because of COVID-19? Well, because of the virus. And... Because I don't get to play with I very much. No, you don't get to play with your neighbor friends anymore because we're doing social distancing, right? Yeah. We hope you enjoy uh, listening to part three, and we want, again, thank everyone who helped us recording this weekend. So our next guest joined us in episode 20. He is a proud Franco-American and is the current mayor of Bitterford, Maine. Alan Casavan, welcome back to the podcast. Glad to be here. So how is Bitterford doing in this well, current crisis? All right. You know, I mean, um, it's tough on everybody, but um, people seem to be socially distancing themselves and trying to help out the local businesses by pickup or whatever it happens to be. And city government is you know, it took a couple of weeks to make sure that all services are maintained, make sure staff can work at home. It's quite a process because there's no playbook. Sure. And what steps are you taking to make sure that those services, could, the services that need to continue can continue? Well, two weeks ago, we started meeting and with staff brainstorming how to deliver those services. And um, then as the governor's orders came through and other realities checked in. Then we had sure. to move staff out of out of City Hall, out of the various um, city buildings. Um, our IT guy, Jerry, worked a system where he could uh, establish uh, computer connections from the homes to the uh, the office, the central uh, IT spot, and it seems to be working. Of course, police and fire and public works, they're there 24-7 anyway. Of course. Yeah. No, that's tough. Now, how much time do you have spent now coordinating between maybe other towns or even at the state level? I'm not sure how much time. I know that there was a con phone conversation with the city managers, with the governor uh, last week. Um, there's been some conversations with, with uh, some of our nearby communities, our sure. state reps. We've been talking with them, too. You know, one of the problems, of course, is that, you know, it's tough for a city to act in isolation. I mean, Absolutely. we can put all these different rules in place, but if our neighboring city or town doesn't do it, that's problematic. Try to find a way in which the region itself could come up with some consistent rules and regulations. Yeah, no, I think that's really smart. And what does your day-to-day -day now look like? I'm curious that you can't go into City Hall. Last week, I went maybe once or twice. This week, probably be about the same. Yeah. I mean, again, the building is essentially shut down and most staff are not there. There were a couple, you know, especially in the clerk's office, there's some that are working at least, you know, processing the mail and so forth. Sure. Most of my work is essentially online. Uh, council meetings are now going through Zoom. Committee meetings are going through Zoom. So it's, it's a different world. Yeah, no, for sure. And one last question for me is, do you have any suggestions, advice for someone kind of like myself, and I'm sure it happens to a lot of people in Biddeford who are now stuck inside for the foreseeable future? Uh, a number of them. First off, that whole idea of social distancing is so, so important because, again, just looking at the data that came out uh, around noontime from the state, the numbers are still going up. 
I mean, anecdotally, I hear about people practicing that and I see that with my own eyes, but this thing is so infectious that it's important for people to think about that all the time. And it's tough because naturally we're gre gregarious people. Right? We, sure. we like to be close, we like to socialize, but that's the number one thing. The number two thing, of course, is that in terms of city services, if, if there's any disruption or any problems, there is a hotline that you could call. You could call city clerk's office anyway, and it'll be redirected. But uh, be sure to reach out. There's a lot of misinformation and fear, I noticed. Sure. Um, so reach out to the department heads or the city clerk out of me. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty easy to find. Awesome. Too easy sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for your time, sir. Good luck. Thank you. Joining us now is a future guest of the podcast, Jane Martin. Now, Jane is a writer and has been published in a number of journals. She is the fiction editor for the online journal Resonance, and she currently teaches writing at McGill University. Welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. Nice to be here. So what does your life look like now? Ah, well, I'm currently in Maine, Bitterford, Maine, my hometown. I came here from Montreal about 10 days ago. So I'm typically in Montreal full time, but um, my mom passed away a few months ago. And so I've been coming back and forth to sort of uh, deal with house stuff. And now that I'm here, I decided to stay put for a while because uh, there's a state of emergency in Montreal. It's pretty bad in Montreal. So so before coming here, uh, I was just staying put in my house in Montreal. We were doing um, online teaching, and um, now I'm doing online teaching from here. Uh, yes. from and my days are just walking outside at the beach now here in Maine. I have a broken wrist, so oh, trying geez. to... <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> trying, to, trying to figure out how to take care of my broken wrist. And what else? Kind of, you know, I'm kind of a, a case study in, what, I think, what not to do during a global pandemic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't think I'm doing much healthy, honestly, but um, trying, just trying to get through it. Yeah, now, how has the transition been for you as far as you have all these in-person classes and now, magic, I'm an online teacher. Yeah. Um, well, we start in earnest again tomorrow because there was a suspension of two weeks uh, so that everybody could just uh, be where they needed to be safely. Yeah, I've never taught an online course, so this is different. I just sort of uh, took time to prepare all my remaining uh, lectures and put them online. Now it's just going to be a whole lot of grading online. So far, it hasn't been disruptive too much, but um, probably in like two weeks, I'll feel differently. I'll be doing all my grading, you know, online versus in paper, which I prefer. Yeah, not too dramatic so far, but mostly, mostly things are just kind of boring, you know? <laughs> <laughs> now, did you notice a difference at all between when you went from Montreal to Biddeford and how the two areas are kind of handling this? Um, yeah, okay, I left, so 10 days ago, that was before the state of emergency in Montreal. Um, now, Quebec, the province of Quebec has the most cases of any province, and I think the most deaths. So I've heard from my friends still there that it's, um, you know, it's pretty strict. I think there's police surveillance right now. In Maine, it's, it's while it's um, serious and everybody is social distancing and everybody is isolating, we can still go out for walks, you know. Gotcha. Um, it feels a little bit freer here just because it's a little um so far it's hit a little bit uh less hard here but um and I was going to go back to Montreal to get my my wrist treated but I found out that coming from the U.S. I would be um I would be forcibly quarantined for 14 days and I I think the police would come to check up on me at my house oh to make wow sure. yeah and I guess I could be jailed for six months or fined seventy five thousand dollars if I exited my house so I decided to um stay here and try to figure out the insurance here for my to get to get help for my wrist but yeah so it's kind of intense kind of intense. seriously now the last question question excuse me we've been asking everybody and your answer may be funny considering what you've said so far uh <laughs> what would you recommend for somebody like myself who's stuck in an apartment with nowhere to go for the foreseeable future oh my god okay well maybe can I say what not to do? <laughs> sure. Answer whatever way you like. <laughs> like, don't become a social media addict like I have become. Um, I think it's, like, really bad. It's, like, it's just bad. Let me see. I'd say 
if you can do exercise indoors, do that. Do something like move around. Do things that we know to be healthy for humans as much as you can indoors. I think, oh, you know, like little, um, actually like FaceTime or um, Facebook video meetings with good friends. That's really helped me a lot. And documentaries, good documentaries. There you go. <laughs> I like that too. Very yeah. cool. Well, Jane, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Appreciate be well. It. Be yes. safe. Be yeah. well, everybody. All right, joining us now is Lynn Levesque. She's a future guest of the podcast, and she's a blogger and author of the terrific book, Jean Chevalier, Fille de Roi, Her Story. Lynn, thank you very much for joining us. No problem. Thanks now, very much for having me on your show. Sure. Now, where are we talking to you from now? I'm in Dieppe, France, which is about an hour, two hours north slightly northwest of Paris. I'm on the English Channel. Gotcha. All right. And what does life look like where you are now? Well, as far as I know, we haven't had a case of the coronavirus here. They are, we are in lockdown, um, which means that we cannot leave the, our home with, except for five or six conditions, one of which is um, if you your work requires requires it. Second is to go for food. The third is to walk your uh, your cat or your dog your dog. Mm. Sorry, and get a little exercise. But they just p become stricter now. We have to have pa a paper signed um, that we sign ourselves that say why we are out. And now we have to put our time on the document so that we are only allowed an hour worth of exercise a day. Wow. Okay. Now, how long has this been happening? Macron put it into effect on the 16th, and they tightened it, I think, on Tuesday, this past Tuesday, on the 24th, to include the requirement of only an hour's worth of exercise. Gotcha. Um, and we are subject to fines. Um, the first fine can be 135 euros. And if you re repeat, if you're a repeat offender, all the way up to 5,000 euros. Wow. All right. So how are you spending your time? And do you have any suggestions for the rest of us now who find ourselves inside all the time? Well, no, I have no suggestions because <laughs> I am in very bad uh, I have a very bad habit of just keeping on top of the news all the time oh, wow. in the United States and in the world. I'm trying, I'm also in the middle of a move, trying to move from one place to another, and that's oh, making geez. it very complicated. So I am not a good, I don't have any good suggestions. I am staying in touch with friends, obviously, and trying to stay upbeat with, you know, cartoons and sure. bird songs and things like that. And I am staying in touch with my church, both my church here in France and my church in Boston, watching the, the services and things like that. Sure. And now, are they, is it still way too early to even speculate on when you guys might have turned the curve over there in France? Yes, it's too early to uh, yeah. speculate. I can't keep track of the different statistics. Um, sure. But, it, you know, our rate is continuing to climb. I don't think we're as bad as Italy. As far as I know, we're not as bad as Italy or Spain. Um, we're in, apparently, I just read this morning that the, the hospital system is in better shape than the hospital system in the United States. I can't speak to Canada or wherever sure. else. But things are being strained, obviously. Uh, it's a course. strange situation, a very I strange situation. Not like anything I've seen before, that's for sure. Right. The um, only thing I can do um, is I'm thinking of writing a blog sure. about what might it have been like for Jeanne in the 17th, or for anybody in the 17th century who had to live, for example, she was living in a basically a cabin isolated on the south of the south bank of the St. Lawrence River. And with three children, three or four children at the time, at one time. And, you know, so I sort of think of what, what her life might have been like. She didn't have an internet. She didn't have telephone. Yeah, right. Where, where, she couldn't go shopping at her, you know, once a day or whatever. 
and sometimes her husband was out hunting animals or hunting for food or whatever. And so I sort of think about what was it like back in the 17th century to be alone, particularly in the winter, you know, so that's a perspective I try to hold, but um, it's difficult. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you. I really, really appreciate you joining us, Lynn. Well, you're welcome, and good luck to you. Yes, you as well. Stay safe. Okay, you too. Now, our guest, Jason Newton, appeared in episode 18 of the podcast, and he will be on again. He also contributed to our Why Do You Tell the Franco-American Story blog series. Now, Jason is a visiting assistant professor of labor relations, law, and history at Cornell. Jason, thank you for joining us again, sir. Yeah, thanks for having me. What does life in Ithaca, New York look like right now? Well, you know, to go along with kind of the, the dire global situation, it's it's raining and cloudy right now. So it even the, the kind of weather matches kind of everybody's mentality right now, I think. It's, it's interesting. Everything's kind of chaotic right now, but, you know, I've had some time to really, you know, sit and, and get to work on my book manuscript and, and read a lot and do a lot of research. So there's pros and cons for sure. Yeah. Now, how many classes were you teaching at the time? Two classes of 60 students. So it's one of the larger classes in the ILR school. And, you know, Cornell decided to give us basically three weeks to prepare to transition online. So two weeks um, break for preparation, and then that came right up to the students' spring break. So um, we're just, everybody's just getting ready to, to transition fully online. Gotcha. And how's that process been, transitioning everything within, you know, two weeks from being a um, uh, in-person class that you've been prepping for forever to uh, all of a sudden, oh, wow, now it's an online class. Yeah, well, I think, you know, my a history class like mine is more kind of a traditional college class where the students get together and, you know, listen to a lecture along with a reading and, and ask questions um, so I don't foresee that being a huge change of moving that online. Um, you know, it'll, it'll be uh, a little less um, kind of personable. We can't, sure. I can't kind of, you know, um, interact in the same way. But, you know, delivering the content shouldn't be that difficult. Unfortunately, like I'm very familiar with the technology for doing it from doing things like this and other interviews. So um, hopefully it'll go smoothly. Sure. Now, have they extended the end of the term because of this? Or are you guys still scheduled to end at the same time? And how does this impact, you know, terms going forward? I, I don't know. I assume you guys have summer classes and summer programs. They have extended the semester um, I'm kind of right now figuring out how to still fit everything in. And I think, you know, some certain things are still kind of being decided at the administrative level. Um, and I did typically teach the summer classes, and that's also kind of up in the air right now. Uh, I really like teaching the summer classes. I teach, you know, smaller classes to low income and first generation incoming freshmen oh, wow. um, but really they don't know if uh that's going to happen if it's going to happen online i think you know as with a lot of different things it's, we're just kind of taking things as they come and deciding daily weekly what what's going to happen sure okay now we'll get you out of here on this what suggestions would you have for someone like myself who is now stuck in an apartment and uh, doesn't foresee leaving for quite some time. Picking up a good history book is always uh, something that you can consider. You know, I, I was telling my students that, you know, there's a lot of good environmental history on the effects that um, diseases and pandemics have had on, um, you know, world events. Uh, so if I can just give a few recommendations, if people want to read uh, anything by Alfred Crosby, 
Uh, there's also a good book called Plagues and People by William McNeil, which really, you know, talks about how something as insignificant as like a microbiotic kind of being can affect all have these massive effects on on global commerce and trade and world events um you know i've also been doing a lot of cooking there you so, go you know if you want to try out uh, an alteration on your pork pie <laughs> recipe or i i've been baking like a lot of sourdough bread i know like a lot of other people have been doing that i've, I've been reading about it on twitter but you know that takes a lot of time so you have the time now to focus on things like that i think that's awesome jason thank you for joining us sir yeah thanks for having me so our next guest is someone we spoke with way back in episode three an episode that turned out to be a really really important episode for the podcast and it really helped us take off susan panette is a professor at the university of maine orno where she also serves as the director of Franco-American Program. Susan, welcome back to the podcast. Hi, nice to see you guys. Uh, Susan, maybe you could start by just letting us know what consequences this virus has had on Franco-American programs, University of Maine. It's been really hard because we work a lot with students. So, you know, a couple, this started a couple weeks back, right before spring break, when the university decided that they were not gonna have the students come back after spring break been very hard because normally we have the students around and it was hard. I was with them. I run an after school French program. And so we were in the after school French program when we got the notice, <laughs> when the students got the notice on their phones that they wouldn't be coming back. And they were so upset and so stressed out because they didn't know if they were going to get refunds on their room and board. They didn't know what they were going to have to do with their books. Some of them were renting books. All of these issues that they were suddenly faced with and having to pack up and go home and then on top of all the anxiety of of the virus and so you know it was re it's been really hard seeing those students having to manage the stress and of this whole thing and um so yeah so this has been going on for us for quite a while and then the university decided to have us all work remotely um which has been hard because Normally, you know, at the center, not only are there lots of students around, we have, there's lots of people around, community people dropping in. Um, we work together a lot. And so it's just been kind of that center, which kind of holds us all together. All, all of a sudden it's closed down. And so that's been difficult. So we've been switching to doing online events. And, you know, Jake has been working on some online projects anyway and some grants. So we're just kind of trying to do that remotely zoom meetings and all that stuff remotely but our students are having a tough time of it not only financially but also just the disruption of it all sure. you know, and then now they have to go to online teaching jake and i are teaching a class online right now and you know you can see in the students they're not it's, not, it's hard for them to keep up and it's just different something we talked quite a bit about on this podcast is the resolve them all uh, so what is the status of the Rassemblement and uh, maybe tell us what might be replacing it? So the Rassemblement, okay, so we, so right now we haven't officially canceled the Rassemblement because everything at the university, I think they, they gave an arbitrary date or I don't know if it was arbitrary, but they said something like April 15th or something, everything was canceled. So officially it's not canceled, but of course, given the way things are unfolding, um, we haven't really decided what we're going to do. What I imagine is going to happen is that we'll do something virtually. We'll probably have a rassemblement similar to what we were doing before, but just have it on Zoom starting on a Friday night and have people present. We'll organize a schedule of people who are still up for doing it and then do something on Saturday. Um, but we really haven't made any kind of hard and fast. We've been working on getting some online gatherings together that'll start this week. And I imagine that in our staff meeting this week, we'll talk about that assemblement, kind of what, what's going to unfold with that. Gotcha. That's a major bummer if we can't do that for sure. Uh, but I definitely want to ask if you have any tips for someone like myself who is now stuck inside. Tips for, I don't know, I've been baking a lot of bread. My grandmother <laughs> baked bread, so I would say that's a good thing to do. And my son's been 
learning. You know, my son's been taking French lessons from someone in France on through the c computer. And so, I don't know, those are two suggestions that we've been dealing with. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Susan. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you very much. Nice talking. All right. One of the great things that has come about uh, from the podcast is that I've been able to make some new friends in Quebec. And one of the friends is going to be joining the podcast now. Jean-Philippe Letoile uh, is also a really, really good teacher. Thanks to him, I have now been introduced to a ton of Quebecois culture. Jean-Philippe, thank you for joining the podcast. Pleasure is mine. Now, where do you live? Uh, actually, I live in a small village near the town of Drummondville, which uh, invented the poutine. Invented the poutine, that's right. We're going to have an episode about that someday. Now, what does your town, village, Drummondville look like now? Uh, actually, with the coronavirus, uh, I'm a school teacher, so uh, we've been closed for like two weeks. Uh, most most school, I think all of schools are uh, in Quebec. And uh, Drummondville itself is pretty locked up right now. Uh, you only can uh, go outside if you need to go to grocery stores, buy food, buy uh, essentials thing, essential things. You mentioned uh, obviously schools been closed for a while. Uh, have they canceled school for the year yet, or are they still just setting dates that they hope to be able to come back by? No, they're evaluating the situation as uh, I guess they want to see if our measures are working, uh, but. Actually, what's official is that they are closed until uh, May 1st, if I'm not mistaken. Gotcha. Now, a lot of the schools in the states, again, depends almost school by school, state by state, uh, have taken all their classes, like in New Hampshire, they've taken all their classes and they've already, be, they've automatically just become online classes. So now we have all these teachers, I know who's been, my mom's been teaching forever, had, you know, 48 hours to all of a sudden learn to take all of our stuff and make it into an online class. So it's been a pretty hectic because all these students are now trying to learn how to be online students for the first time. Is that what you guys are doing or is it just plain off? Uh, actually, that's a mixed uh, situation. Uh, I would say for universities and to uh, make things clear over here, we don't have a uh, college and university. Both are uh, the same. You explained me the difference with the US. Yeah, but, can you uh, explain how that works? Maybe for people who don't yeah, know, because I didn't know until uh, I talked to you. The school system for what we call Education Superior in Quebec is uh, about, we start first what we call a college, but it's actually, well, I don't know what the equivalent, but it's like a pre-university. And then you start your uh, little classes and then you go to the university if you want the more advanced classes. But there are two distinct levels. Yeah. Uh, but actually, college and universities, which we call CEGEP and university, are actually going for uh, online classes. But for high school and elementary school, I think we still, we're still not there yet. I think they're waiting to see if we will uh, open sooner. Gotcha. So what? So you have no school. You're not teaching. You don't need to put together online classes. What are you doing with yourself while <laughs> we sit and wait for things to improve? Uh, actually, uh, we, we have a lot of uh, communication with our schools, uh, school board. They are sending us like COVID-19 information related about our uh, basic stuff like pays, how will you guys get paid and uh, everything if we need psychological support and all those things. Sure. So I think the first step they are doing right now is trying to stab stabilize the situation. But as uh, for myself, uh, I'm uh, actually building uh, videos on and online classes. I'm preparing for it because I guess that may become the reality. So that's the lot of what I'm doing right now. Awesome. That's a really smart move. Now, what, what do you teach? We call it uh, Univers Social, which would be social studies. So uh, gotcha. I would say uh, kind of mixed with history, geography, and some bit of uh, political philosophy. Awesome. I think that's very cool. All right. And last question, do you have any suggestions for someone like myself who is now stuck in the apartment for a very, very long time? Oh, yeah. Uh, actually, I would, uh, if you want to introduce yourself to some uh, French-Canadian culture, uh, not limited to Quebec, uh, of course, but where I, I would say about Quebec, I think it's most interesting. Uh, what you could do is to see the more crunchy humor we had. Uh, one popular uh, humorous group we have, if you can understand some French, is actually RBO, RBO, which is Roquebezare, which is pretty interesting, a bit 
they they are funny, but they're also making pretty. Uh, it's not kids' humor. Okay. Like gotcha. Uh, yeah. Uh, but you have also uh, great singers you could uh, see. Uh, one of the best show to watch uh, about COVID nineteen uh, actually, which is called Info Man, which I shown you. Uh, yeah. Couple of times, but yeah. actually, uh, to see those Canadian things would be good. But the issue will have uh, you guys in the US will have is that you need some kind of uh, VPN to watch them or things like that. All right, Jean Philippe, thank you for joining us, sir. Stay safe. Ask uh, you your too. wife and your family, man. Yeah, uh, please uh, have a safe uh, confinement for everyone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Goodbye. Joining us now is Renee McMaster. Now, Renee will be a future guest of the podcast. Renee grew up in Quebec, but now lives in New Hampshire, where she owns a really awesome food truck called Hot Mess Puts In. Thank you for talking <laughs> with us, Renee. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you for having me. So... We are hearing an awful lot about the impact of this virus on small businesses, especially those in the food industry. So how are yes. things going? What's the deal with you and Hot Mess Puts In? Well, actually, we've been pretty lucky um, because, of course, it's a food truck, so it's takeout. Yep. So they call that is an essential. <laughs> so so we, we've been lucky with Rochester City of Rochester, they kind of give us a few locations we can go. Gotcha. Uh, we actually met with uh, the health inspector yesterday uh, for all the regulation, and uh, he actually gave us a list of more location gotcha. because they want to um, give the chance of all, all the very small businesses in, sure. in town. Right. So, and we're part of it now, this year. So, um, there's two other food truck with us. So, what we do is uh, we just keep contact and we do the rotation together and we have a good communication. So, um, if one day on one location is not going there, it's going gotcha. to the next location. So, that's great. I mean, I'm, I'm happy about it. Of course, we have to be careful. Um, right. We wear gloves all the time, and we change, we wash our hand every time. Um, so you know, you have to be careful. Of course, it keeps some kind of distance to from the customer. And but we we lucky to be uh, to be in business. Yeah, you keep rolling. That's good to hear. Now I know one thing about your truck is that you are super super active during that summer fall festival time, and yes. you go to a lot of events. And yeah. I'm just curious what your schedule is looking like now. Do you have any idea even what's coming? I mean, we have a lot uh, on schedule for, but well, we had a lot on schedule sure. for May, April, May, and June, but everything yeah. is on hold right now. Sure. Um, so uh, what we're going to do, we just kind of keep going in town, um, try to keep um keep going and try to give the opportunity to other people to have a different food um, because, you know, uh, sometimes people just want some change and they want to get out of sure. the house a little bit, go get the food. And so we, uh, we're going to be like this for a couple of months at least. So, and after that, we see what happens. Hopefully after that, that's going to change. It, it, everybody's going to go back to normal. But right now uh, the safety is, you know, no, of the, course. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Now, obviously, we want to make sure we get as many people out to you, grab it and put in as possible. So if somebody wants to know where they can get some food from you on a day-to-day -day basis, where should we send them to take a look? Well, actually, um, I have a Facebook, Facebook page that I post every day where I am that day. Um, and I post what it's new on the menu. So every week that's going to change. So sure. people, you know, it's the best to follow me on, on the, the Facebook page at Hot Mess Poutine Food Truck. Yes. There you go. So yes. people are still going to be able to get you. They just may have to look a little bit harder than normal in order to find you. Uh, yes. But, you know, the, it, it's easy on the, on the page. So because Perfect. every day I post something. So Very what nice. time is going to be there? What location? So if there's some change about the hours. Um... I got you. Well, best of luck. It's awesome. You have an awesome, awesome food truck. So best of luck. Again, oh, best of luck. You. And thank you again for joining uh, us. I appreciate thank it. Thank you for having me. Stay safe. Anytime. Yes. 
So joining us now is someone that we have not yet had on the podcast, though I think it's probably time we remedy that, but she's a name that will be very familiar to many of the listeners of this podcast. Elizabeth Blood is a French professor in the Department of World Languages and Cultures at Salem State University. She was also a French language textbook author and a French to English translator where she has done some really, really important work. Her specializations are in French language pedagogy and the teaching of Francophone cultures with a current focus on the history and culture of Quebec and Franco-American communities in New England. Elizabeth, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Now, we mentioned that you were at Salem State. So what does Salem State look like now? <laughs> um, we had gone out. We went on spring break two weeks ago. Spring break was supposed to be a week, and then they extended it for a second week. And during that time, told us to get ready to put everything online. So we're going to be teaching online for the rest of the semester. So we start tomorrow. So <laughs> it's a, sort of a, a brand new world for everybody. Yeah, no, I'm sure we're hearing that a lot. And I think your perspective on this would be particularly interesting because just me could see, I work obviously in a school that does a lot of online education, but we don't offer French or language classes? Because I think that would be, of all the subjects, I think that would be a pretty major transition to go from being the in-class experience to an online experience when we talk about a, a language class. So how are you guys making that happen? Yeah, it's going to be a little bit crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it, the good thing is that we've already had a couple months with the students, so I already have a rapport with them, sure. and they know sort of what I expect and how I work and so, and I know them, you know, individually. So um, at least we already have that relationship. Sure. I am trying in the interest of trying to accommodate, uh, like we don't know what students are going to be going through. We have the capability to do uh, online Zoom classes at our regular class times, sure. but I'm not sure if students are all going to be still available at our regular class times. Right. So um, I'm preparing like video lectures and then having a Zoom meeting with them once a week that they can opt into if they want to. Now, has this, do you have, I guess, do you already have in the works turning like summer classes into online education? Because it seems uh, like there's just so much up in the air that would be tough for a school right now. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, they are, they have just announced that they're going to do summer one classes are going to be all online. They haven't announced anything about summer two. So summer two starts in July, but we're hoping at least by next fall, things will be back to normal. So yeah, so you are one of the many educators who we've talked to a bunch that had about, I don't know, 48 hours notice to take everything they've ever done in the traditional classroom setting and turn it online. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. but, you know, it, it's an experiment. We're all just going to do our best. But I have some seniors. I have a couple of senior classes that were mostly online anyway. Um, they're working on research projects and translation projects. We're doing a couple of um, Franco-American translation projects, actually. Very cool. So what are those? So uh, a bunch of students and I are collaborating on translating French-Canadian folktales. Awesome. And we're going to do a collection of folk tales um, in English or maybe do bilingual, like the French and the English together. And I have a student who's majoring in art and French, and she's going to do the illustrations. Very cool. So, some original illustrations. And we'll try to publish that online, probably for free on our um, Salem State website. That would be awesome. And uh, then we're also doing some translations for Leslie Choquette at the French Institute. They have a dictionary of biographies of Franco-American authors that were originally written only in French. So we've been little by little, I think we're only on the B's. So we have a long way to go. Um, sure. but we're, we're translating the biographies for her, for, for her website. Awesome. All right. We'll get you out of here on this, but I'm curious, how are you now spending your time and what suggestions would you have for someone like myself who is stuck in an apartment for the foreseeable future? <laughs> Hmm. Well, I'm still working full time. I'm actually there you go. in more hours in the past week than I have <laughs> weeks before that. I'm also still I'm working on my own translation project. I'm translating a uh, history of Franco Americans of Worcester. Nice. Um, yep. And that will go up on our our website and within the next year. For you people at home, <laughs> um, exactly. there's a ton of stuff you can if you're if you want to work on your French skills. There are a ton of 
great websites that you can use to practice your French and learn French. There's tons of, I've been telling my students, just watch on Netflix. There's tons of French TV shows and movies. Um, we were just watching in my in my intermediate French class, we were watching Bone Cop, Bad Cop. I don't know if you've ever seen it. I have not. It's an awesome movie from Quebec. <laughs> it's, okay, it's about, good. it's a, like a, a buddy cop um, murder mystery comedy movie. Awesome. Um, and it's good. a detective from Quebec and a detective from Ontario have to work together to solve a, <laughs> to find That's a serial awesome. killer. Um, and so there's a lot of like back and forth about English versus French in Canada. And um, it's fun too. And the students really like it. And that's on Netflix along with Bone Cop, Bad Cop, duh, which is awesome. <laughs> If you're looking for something fun to do, it's a bilingual movie. It's in French and English, so it's really fun. Perfect. I'm definitely going to have to check that out. I love that recommendation. Very cool. So thank you for joining us, Elizabeth. You're welcome. Okay, joining us now is Luke Trepanier. Now, I first ran into Luke at a Franco-American Center event in Manchester. Uh, where it was pretty obvious uh, that he did not have the same accent I did. Now, over the past... <laughs> couple of years. Luke has become a great friend and contributor to the Franco-American Center. Luke, welcome to the podcast, sir. Hi. Now, where are you living? Uh, I live in uh, Saint-Hyacinthe. Now, the city is, uh, I would say, like uh, 30 minutes in uh, in the south of Montreal. What does life look like where you are now? I live in uh, Lanex, they call it. And it's a part of the city, so it's, um, I would say, it's, it's really uh, quiet, for sure. We uh we actually have only uh, one grocery store, uh, two convenience, and um, so and there are uh, there are not a lot of people around, you know. But uh, it's uh, yeah, it's quiet. What do you do for a living, and how has this impacted that? Because I think this is important. Yeah, I teach music in high school in Saint Hyacinthe. Uh, how a school is actually two thousand. Uh, we have two thousand students. They have decided to close the school on um, March twelfth, uh, so uh, they shut down the school. Even though the government hadn't had asked by that time, but uh, the, um, yeah, the school board decided to shut it down. So we uh, and we off. I think it's it's almost three weeks or something. Yeah, and. And for some places I know, because, I mean, obviously schools over here are all canceled too. Mm -hmm. but a lot of places have tried to do the transition to online education. But, I mean, you you work at an enormous school. And it doesn't seem like that's what's going on with you guys. Yeah, we don't we don't have like, uh, we don't have computer stuff for doing that. Because probably uh, we uh, we were we weren't prepared. Sure. For, so, but, uh, you know, how are... Uh, director yeah it makes sense so she um she asked us to 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 try to put on some uh, exercises online just to get just to try to uh, reach out the kids or something you know the um, uh, the bottom line is to uh, not to stress those kids or whatever you know so sure. to, uh, do it as, as possible as we can do no no that's tough for sure so what are you doing then to pass oh, yeah. this time yeah, uh, you know, I'm a I'm a drummer, so I play, I play awesome. drums. But I have like a, a electric bass, electric guitar. So and I have like a, a little uh, studio of recording. So and I, I so uh, I've always tell I've always I've always said to me to myself uh, I would like to uh, to uh, record songs and lyrics and uh, and try to uh, you know hear my voice or something. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah and I, I do a lot of reading and uh, it's, yeah like um you know i've been learning english for five years so every morning i try to uh, read something uh like uh for the time being i'm into motown history nice so, yeah there's a a great book you know and uh, this book is uh, obviously in english so it's it's uh it's one way for me to learn english and write stuff and you know so, yeah have fun no, that's awesome. Now, have you been able to connect with any fellow teachers, musicians, you guys getting together online? Uh, no, I don't know why, because, but, <laughs> but I think for, I think for, the, um, you know, uh, as you can see on Facebook, there are a lot of um, musicians everywhere trying sure. to, uh, so, 
and that's probably um yeah um maybe if we have to stay home longer maybe we will uh, we will have to deal with it and maybe put on some new stuff and uh, new things or but yeah obviously this is not a very fun situation but yeah. it would be it would be great if something positive that could come out of it was you had an opportunity to finally create some of the music that you've been hoping to do for a while i think that'd be cool yeah absolutely well, thank you for joining us, Lou. Appreciate it, sir. Yeah. Our next guest joined us in episode 17, where she introduced us to a ton of really interesting Acadian history. Lise Pelletier is the director of Acadian Archives at the University of Maine at Fort Kent. Lise, thank you for joining us again. Thank you, Jesse. Nice to see you. Now, what do things look like now up in Fort Kent? Very surreal. I guess it's eerie, not much activity in terms of students are, are gone, faculty are off campus, almost all the offices are closed. Uh, work goes on at the Acadian Archives because requests for research and services keep uh, coming in. And then of course there's the technical aspect of archival work, uh, which is cataloging collections and uh, preserving them and all of that good stuff is, is still going on. I'm working from home, though, as most people are as well. Yeah. The, uh, the major difference, I think, with everybody else is that our proximity to uh, the border brings another added layer of frustration to um, everything else that we are no longer able to do. Um, my mother lives about 15 minutes from here. And literally, if I go in my backyard, I can throw a stone across the river, and that's New Brunswick. So I haven't been able to see her in three weeks. Oh, wow. Uh, all my kids and grandkids are in Canada. So, yeah, so that part of it is emotional. And, um, you know, there's a worry. My mother's 90 years old. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, we're just, you know, keeping our fingers crossed and uh, hoping for the best. Otherwise, I think people are, like, are extremely resilient. Uh, they uh, they really have rallied and um, have decided to be of service to those most in need. Uh, we have a restaurant here in Fort Kent, the Whistle Stop, that decided they were going to use their inventory of food and make meals for senior citizens and they've been That's delivering awesome. them. It That's is awesome. awesome. And it, it is the spirit of community really that um, keeps us going in, in a lot of ways as well. I'm glad you brought it up because I was going to ask about that because it seems, and I've never been there, but from what you have told me about this, uh, about Fort Kent, it's like the uh, community spans both countries. Yes. It's like the larger, it's like a, there's a border that just happens to run yeah. right through the middle of this giant community, and all of a sudden now you're cut off from half of it. Right, exactly. Yeah. No, that's tough. No, and as far as the work of the archive, you had mentioned that that still continues. Is there anything that has been impacted? Because I, I would think a lot of archival work would be tough to do from remote. Yes. Um, so my assistant is, uh, she does the technical aspect of, of the collections and she has to go in. Um, my work is, and of course, uh, we don't get patrons or visitors because um, all the, the, you know, I mean, it, everything is, is uh, closed to the public. Sure. Um, I do a lot of work from home. I've been helping, for example, to set up an exhibition in Portland, Maine. Um, and I'm reviewing uh, pedagogical activities um, to make sure they're historically accurate and uh, relevant, uh, So, uh, which I really enjoy, uh, and I can do that from home. Uh, so that goes on. Other than that, I'm, I may get desperate and start gramenaging. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what that is. Gramenage is spring cleaning. <laughs> Spring cleaning. All right. That sounds like a blast. Okay. So my last question then, what, and I hope it's a different answer than next, I'm not super hype about spring cleaning, but what suggestion would you give to someone like myself who's now stuck in an apartment for the foreseeable future? 
Yes, very. I, I suggest you go outside every day. I think that's essential for the morale. Um, you don't have to congregate with anybody. You don't have to walk with anybody. Um, I think it's it's a time as well that we can appreciate slowing down. Uh, there's there's really a grace and a benefit um, to that that we uh, we don't think about when we're on the treadmill, right? Um, we go at full speed and we like it because it produces results. Um, sometimes though, we, uh, when we're going too fast, we, you know, we really, um, don't see much. Um, and so I think this is a time to just kind of say, okay, well, this is it. Uh, there's nothing I can do about it. So let's make the most of it. I've been reading like crazy. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so that's that's good. Um, yeah, and catch up with uh, with people if you can on Facebook or you know write them an email or call. It's all good. FaceTime if you can do that, it's good. Awesome, I like that answer. Thank you, Lisa. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay, joining us now is the very first guest we ever spoke with on the French Canadian Legacy podcast. Tim Bullew is the man behind the immensely successful New Hampshire Puts In Fest, and without Tim, I am not sure this podcast is even a thing. So, Tim, thank you very much for joining us again, man. No problem. So what does your new reality look like now? New reality is uh, working from home every day and doing school with my son and my wife every day and uh, just kind of hanging out around the house in the backyard. Yeah, so you've you've had a morph all of a sudden into a homeschool teacher, like so many is what I'm hearing. Yeah, that's right. Well, my I'll be honest. My wife, Laura, is the, uh, the <laughs> primary teacher. Uh, she does a really good job. Her background is in education, so we're really fortunate that she can do that with him. And I do a lot of like his uh, gym class. There you um, go. Things like that. <laughs> yeah. That's good to help with. Now, the one yeah. question I'm sure a lot of people, especially who listen to this podcast, are going to be anxious to hear. What is going on with Punsiv Nest? Uh, sure. So, I mean, right now we're, we're scheduled for June 13th of 2020. Um, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen there. Things are becoming difficult, obviously, in, in New England. And, you know, just talking to other festivals around there. We're obviously have things open. We've looked at alternate sure. dates. Um, it's really dependent on how our, how our restaurants fare. So we're trying to be supportive of them to kind of weather this un, unforeseen uh, crisis. So put Sinfest is one of very many, many things that are just in kind of wait and see mode at this point. Yeah, exactly. Good. All right. So the last question that I'm asking a whole lot of people, do you have any tips, advice, suggestions for someone like myself who now finds himself stuck in an apartment for a very long time. <laughs> wow, uh, that is a, quite a question. Um, honestly, my um, advice to people who are stuck in an apartment or at home is um, this is more of a, we'll say this the New Hampshire way in a bit, figure out something to do that can make you independent of the system per se. Can you learn how to do something online? Can you sell online? Can you create a course or something that you know? Use, find a way to use your knowledge to make some money on the side. I think that when we come out of this, the side hustle gig economy is not going anywhere. And it's a good time to embrace it and find a way to make a new revenue stream for yourself. I love it. All right, Tim. Thank you much. Appreciate it, sir. No problem. No problem, man. Joining us now is the guest we had on our 14th episode. He is the executive director of the Franco-American Center out of Manchester, New Hampshire. John Tuzignon, thanks for joining us, sir. Oh, thank you, Jesse. So what's going on in your life, and what does the Franco-American Center look like now? It's, it's been an interesting few weeks for, sure for us, has. for uh, everybody. Of course, it's Francophony Month, so uh, we like to celebrate our similar uh, situations with French speakers around the world. And unfortunately, the current situation is not one we like to share. We've been making some changes, uh, working on uh, turning our uh, Franco-American Center events into virtual events and uh, giving people a way that from the comfort of their home, they can uh, still explore French language, culture, and heritage. And those updates, are you just going to be on the website? Is that where people will be able to find them? 
Yes, we're in the process of doing that. We're going to be uh, updating our uh, classes. Of course, we've had to go to virtual classes like so many people have. Sure. Uh, but the advantage with that is that there are people at home, I'm sure, today that are wishing that they could pick up a little bit of French. And maybe now they have the time. And through the magic of the Internet, they'll be able to commute pretty easily. No, I like that. Get as many positives out of the situation as we can, for sure. Now, maybe you have a tip. Do you have a tip for us, for someone like myself, who's now stuck inside for the foreseeable future? Well, I would uh, certainly look at all the various uh, aspects of uh, French. Uh, there's a gr it's a great time to uh, catch a French movie. And there's a lot of great ones that are out there that are subtitled. So even an English speaker can watch and appreciate the plot while learning some of the language. Uh, some great French music out there. I know you start out with uh, José Vachon, and she's uh, fabulous. Yes, but sir. A whole host of uh, fabulous uh, French performers. I find that uh, music and films are a great way to uh, have some some French kind of going into your subconscious and uh, making you uh, more capable of feeling like you're, uh, if you're trapped at home, at least you could be trapped at home on the Riviera in France or in uh, the fifth arrondissement in <laughs> Paris. That's awesome. Well, thank you, John. Good luck to you. Thank you for all you are doing for the Franco-American Center, sir. Much appreciated. All right. Thank you very much. Keep the podcast coming. I'll be listening to them, maybe listening a second time while I'm at home. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. All right. Bye-bye. Now our fathers look at us and sigh with despair To think that everything they love we simply do not share But the spirit never dies, our culture will survive Each of us must choose how much to keep alive each of us must choose how much to keep alive. Special thanks to Josie Vashon for providing the music. You can find more about her at josievashon.com. This podcast was produced and edited by Mike Campbell. If you have any questions or comments, please email us at fclpodcast at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at FCL Podcast for more information about the topics discussed. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to this episode.